So Thanksgiving time is upon us, and this is a holiday. I mean, I like about all the holidays out there, but especially I like this one because it applies to everybody, regardless of uh, race and origin and uh, even religion. There's no religious uh, belief system or anything out there that extols the virtues of not being thankful. Christians should be thankful, Jewish people say they should be thankful, Muslims say they should be thankful, Buddhists and everybody. So it applies to all of us. And I wonder, as universal of a concept as the holiday is, I wonder how many people this year actually express that kind of thank thankfulness. And um, here's an opinion I'll share with you. I think a lot of people would agree with me that like many of our holidays, Thanksgiving through the years has sort of changed and evolved into something that it probably wasn't quite intended to be. I wonder, again, how many people really have hearts of thankfulness when Thursday rolls around. Do they just look at it as an opportunity to get together and uh, cook and eat way too much food and watch some football and maybe uh, use the day to look through the newspaper as to you know what kind of Black Friday sales I can get? And um, even if you're not interested in any of that stuff, maybe some people are just thankful they have a day off work. And so... That being said, thankfulness, it's not a material thing that we can really measure. We can't check somebody at the door. Are you thankful today? And uh, it's not like if I get sick, I might be able to show you that I have a receipt from the doctor's office that, yep, he checked me out, or uh, maybe they ordered a blood test and that shows some kind of abnormality or, you know, I have a, I took a home uh, flu test or something and it showed positive. Those are material things to prove something on the inside, not so with being thankful. So the point is anyone can say they are thankful just because they're expected to do so. So we hope that we among all people actually express that thankfulness somehow or other because it was largely Christians who held the first Thanksgiving feast way back in 1621. You know the story with the pilgrims and after thanking God after they got them through the first year in the new world and, and all that. So I would say that if a person can't really think of one thing that they are thankful for, well, maybe this message is for you. Because if you are a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, we should have many things that we are thankful for. And this morning, I'd like to look at one thing we should be thankful for that maybe we're not even aware of that we read of in the Bible. And that something occurred about 2,000 years ago when Jesus prayed to God, his Father, for each and every one of us. He actually did that. I don't know if you're aware of that. And that's something that we ought to be thankful for. And so the scripture passage is taken from John 17. Jesus prayed a very lengthy prayer that is recorded in that. That's what John 17 is. It's his prayer. So rather than read the whole prayer near the tail end, he specifically talks about us. And that's what I'd like to focus on this morning, uh, starting at verse 20 and going up through verse 26, which is the end of the chapter. And so uh, the word of the Lord, which is Jesus's prayer, says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Now we're going to preach along this morning. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I'll t pick it up in 22 there. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So, simple three-point message this morning. Three things that we can be thankful for that Jesus mentions in those verses. First of all, we should be thankful that God gives us blessings. Two is we should be thankful that God wants to live with us forever and wants us to live with him forever. And three, be thankful that God is merciful and long-suffering. So the first, first things first, uh, we should be thankful that God gives us blessings. And when you think of it, this prayer that Jesus prayed, which we only read a short portion of, that is a great blessing alone, to know that we were on Jesus' mind as he was awaiting crucifixion. And so who in the world would do such a thing when you are literally on death row, you are awaiting your execution, yet you're praying for other people? If it were me, which would be a, you know, wrongly accused of something and I'm expecting to die within 24 hours, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be praying for other people. I'd be praying that God's going to get me out of this situation. Yet he knew that that was what he had to do. And therefore, that wasn't an issue for them. His issue was those who were following him. And so that uh, led his prayer. That's why Jesus said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That is through the message of the apostles. And that is a combination of the apostles preaching and also the apostles being inspired to write down the scripture, write the rest of the New Testament that we have to this day. And so Jesus was praying for those things at that time. And I found that one of the, the best things that a person can do for another person is not only to pray for that person, but to let them know that you are praying for them. Because uh, studies show that the majority of Americans' prayer lives are not all that good. They are, the majority that is, generally speaking, they're either non-existent or they are just um, very lukewarm at best. So for someone to come up to you and say, I am praying for you or I have prayed for you, that speaks volumes. It really does. And it always lifts my spirits when somebody tells me that they've been praying for me as well. But the thing is, I don't always remember John 17. I don't remember that Jesus actually prayed for me. And that means so much more than any other person praying for me. Now, Jesus praying for us is just the beginning of the blessings, though, that God gives us. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So did you ever consider that if you are a child of God, that means that God, first of all, blessed you, and he blessed you by hand-picking and selecting you. The Bible talks about this in terms of adoption, and we know what that is, and so the Bible speaks to us in terms we can understand. We, uh, we can't choose who our biological children are, but we can choose who we adopt. And we can, when we adopt them, we treat them just as if they are our actual uh, naturally born children. And that's what God has done. He has hand selected us and said, you are now in my family because I specifically want you. And talk about something to be thankful for. Many people think that God just 
considers the human race as some kind of an afterthought, that he's not really concerned with us at all, but that's not what the Bible says. God had us in mind before he created the world, and I can't fathom the kind of love that he had from before he even created this earth and this world that we live in, that we were on his mind first. So on Thanksgiving Day, let's give thanks that God loved us so much that he had us in mind and that he had a plan. And not just having a plan, he worked that plan out to where it is today, to adopt us as his children. Now, second, second thing that we can learn from Jesus' prayer that we should be thankful for is that he desires to live with us and us with him. And both sides of the same coin are very important. And if you don't think that God wants to be bothered with us, well, and that you're not any more than an afterthought to God, you're probably not living a very joyful life, for sure, because you're living apart from the reality and the love of God. And I think a lot of the distress that people face in the world probably stems from their in, inaccurate view of who God is. People think that God has bigger things to worry about than me and maybe the problem I'm dealing with at work or whatever the situation is. God's probably out there in the far reaches of the universe. He's busy creating new worlds and solving problems, you know, elsewhere that isn't even a thought to us. But again, that's not the kind of God that we encounter in the Bible. It's like a man who was telling his buddy one day, he says, you know what? My wife treats me like God. And he's like, wow, you, you have a, a winner there. He says, yep. He says, um, she ignores my existence, but calls on me whenever she needs or wants something. So that's what he uh, thought is like God. And I thought that was uh, sort of uh, comical, but there's truth and good humor, isn't there? And that we can see how that people have that kind of uh, idea from about God. He's only there if we need him. Otherwise, we don't really give him much of a thought at all. And I got to tell you now, you know, none of us are ever born a Christian. And I can remember back before I was. But even so, I, I never thought that God was some kind of, you know, distant being out there not really concerned with us. <clears throat> But I can say that my view has dramatically changed in my walk with him. Uh, <clears throat> when I got converted, my view of God changed a lot. And the more I study and read the Bible, it keeps changing and hopefully getting more accurate. And so my relationship with God as well got a lot better once I realized that He's not like what other people say. He's not this mean, disappointed parent who's just waiting for you to mess up so he can, you know, uh, punish you and, you know, lock you in your room until you've learned your lesson and that kind of thing. He is a loving father who wants to spend time with you. And once I understood that, it just opened up a, a world of difference in my relationship with him. And I think we can get us a little bit of a sense of how God feels towards us. Um, if you think of him like a, a mother or father who's expecting a child, okay? They're expecting parents. They're so excited. You know, someone's going to come along, and this is someone that is part of us, and we created this uh, being, and we're going to bring him home, him or her home, to live with us forever. It's just so exciting, and that's what new birth is like to God, and that little baby, that child means so much to the parent, and so we mean infinitely more to God. That's why he wants us to live with us, and that's what Jesus was praying about in verse 21. He says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so God adopts us into his family in the same way that a parent adopts a child. And when that happens, they get a new last name, they get new privileges, they get the rights as all of the other natural-born children out there. 
In 1 John 4, that apostle writes, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And that goes along with being adopted and being a part of the family. And so it's out of God's love for us that he sent his Son so that we might live. And so on Thanksgiving Day, I know that not everyone gets together with a, you know, a whole household of uh, people and maybe your family is scattered all throughout the country, even the world, or maybe, you know, for whatever reason, you're just going to spend the holiday um, at home uh, by yourself and, and that's okay. It doesn't matter because you are still a part of a better family. You're part of the kingdom of God. Because God created the, the, the God who created the world loves you and he adopted you to be his child for as long as you believe in his son. And now the third reason that we get from Jesus's prayer, the reason to give thanks is again because God is long suffering and merciful. <clears throat> this one really gets to me because this is one that once I became a Christian, it was the light switch came on. You know, the, the electric company finally gave us power again, and you're just seeing things you never understood before. The scales fell off my eyes, and I realized that when I was not walking with him, that uh, any time he could have just said, that's it, and I want nothing to do with you. Yet he waited and he was patient with me and that's his mercy and that's his long-suffering nature. And this gets to the core of the gospel message that says we are all immediately once we are born, we're considered guilty by God. The uh, theological term, they call it original sin. It just means Adam's sin uh, infected and affected every subsequent generation. That's why you can't just live a, quote, good life and be good enough for God. We have that stain of sin no matter what we do. Well, because of that, if you don't do something about it, then you'll be separated from God for eternity. But I'm thankful that as much as God is just and he will punish, he also is loving and merciful and long-suffering and things that relate in that way. That means God doesn't rush to give us what we deserve. Instead, he offers multiple opportunities by which we would not have to suffer the consequences of sin. And that opportunity, of course, is through Jesus Christ if we put our faith in him. And I said that th this concept, this, this is the one that personally gets, gets me every time that I consider it because now that the scales have fallen off of my eyes and I see things more clearly, I just know that by nature, I am so unworthy of God's love and his mercy and his long suffering nature. But we see in verse 24, Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me. See, God chooses us, and he adopts us, and then he hands us over to Jesus and presents us to him. And that's, again, one, just one of many things that we should be thankful for, especially this week, but all year long. If that weren't enough, Peter writes in his second letter, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That doesn't mean everyone will get saved, but he, that's not what he wills. And some people just choose to go their own way. And it is a shame that so many people have a distorted view of God. It seems like people miss the mark. They're either miss short or miss long, as they say. Uh, some people think, again, God is so angry and he's just waiting for us to miss steps so he can judge us. And that's not accurate. While other people go so far to the other extreme 
that they think that God owes them everything and he is just going to, he's waiting up there to forgive every sin that they do, just like it never happened. That's not accurate here either. The reality is somewhere in between. It's a little of both. And so, um, as is oftentimes the case, uh, you know, God will judge us if we try to take advantage of his grace and his mercy. <clears throat> but at the same time, he's also long-suffering and merciful and patient, giving us time to make things right with him. And so I'm so thankful that God doesn't have a short fuse and that God was patient with me every step of the way uh, to answer his call in my life. So what else is there really to say about Thanksgiving and God? We know that the first Thanksgiving feast was not to so much thank the Indians, although they were thankful to them. The pilgrims wanted to give thanks to God because they knew that they had nothing if not for him. I think half of them had died that prior year, yet they said, we're going to thank God that it wasn't more than a half, I guess. And I can stand up here and tell you, you should be thankful on Thanksgiving Day. Okay, well, that's great. Maybe it's probably true, but the fact is people feel what they feel and they don't feel what they don't feel. And so I don't think that a person can be guilted into being thankful. How does a person experience thankfulness? Well, by drawing near to God and his son, Jesus Christ. I think if that happens, we will naturally feel thankfulness for the blessings that we have. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And in the Bible, thanks is quite frequently uh, set contrary to walking in sin. It's one or the other, and it's something that I didn't really consider too much until I saw it in the Bible and thought about it a little bit. It actually makes a lot of sense. Um, in one of his other letters, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So he's setting these two things against each other because thanks should be given to God for the new life that we experience in Jesus Christ. And when we have that new life, we're putting away all those other sinful things that we used to do. That's the ultimate giving of thanks, I think, especially on the, during this time of the year. In the opening, I said how Thanksgiving has probably evolved, um, doesn't quite uh, resemble what it was intended to be in certain areas. But I do think that we as the church can do something about that. Uh, we can shine the light and point people uh, to the way of uh, righteousness and thankfulness uh, for all that God has done for us. And I think one of the best ways that I could uh, wrap up uh, the message is uh, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so Thanksgiving is just another opportunity to shine the light to everyone around you. As I said, um, after all, uh, Christians should be the most thankful people out there. Um, again, uh, we, are, we are the faith that established Thanksgiving Day uh, 402 years ago. And so we know what God has done for us by giving us his son. We also know that God became personal to us by becoming a human, and that human who personally prayed for us some 2,000 years ago because he loves us. And while we're at it, yeah, we should be thankful to God, and I've sort of, you know, uh, talked enough about that, but also make sure that we are thankful for the people in our lives too, our family, our friends, our neighbors, those who are kind to us and generous and encourage us all year long, 
Jesus said that people will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. And so I'm very thankful for that call in my life and for all the blessings God has bestowed upon me. And I hope you all are too. So let us bow our heads and close out with a word of prayer. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all of the blessings in our life. We cannot count all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But the most the, at the top of the list is new life in Jesus Christ. And we can think about all that that means for us. It means that you chose us before the foundation of the world, knowing that we would sin and fall into uh, evil ways. And even then, you knew that you were going to give your son the duty and the opportunity to to give his life for us, uh, to be the, you know, uh, the propitiation of our sins, which is what the scriptures tell us, because the blood of bulls and rams and goats could not atone for sin, yet his blood could, and he was willingly obedient to your call. And that is something we can never thank you enough for, God, but we can try to thank you by living obedient lives, and by just giving you thanks, and by sharing in the good news with other people. God, we ask your blessing on this day and this week, and this Thanksgiving day especially, that we would have the opportunity to not only draw closer to you, but to share that goodness with other people. Maybe there's someone in our family or a a friend that we come across. Uh, Maybe we invite them over for Thanksgiving and You know, they just see how we are different and we can say it's because of Jesus Christ. God, we just are so thankful that you have put us in this position that we carry the light into the world. And we are thankful for so many things, but we just ask your blessing on this day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.